Okay, so in this video, I'm going to show you how to make this crazy, I don't even know what's going on here, but this maze environment, very surreal with all these uh, patterns everywhere. And I'll show you this free add-on that you can use to generate these really intricate maze patterns. And uh, the whole thing is really made out of quite basic shapes. Um, so it should be pretty easy. So we'll just start with a floor. That's usually what I start with just to get a surface to actually work off of. And then I'll just add in uh, either a person or a cube scaled down a little bit like this. And uh, I'll scale that to the height of a person. And then that what that does is, is just gives me a reference for or, or an idea of how big everything else is in the scene. So it's quite hard to tell sometimes if you're in a void how big the objects you're adding are. And when you have this, it makes it quite clear, like you can see here, um, how big the things that you're adding are in the actual scene. Okay, so I'm adding a plane here and I'm just subdividing it with like 10 cuts. And what this is going to be is the base for our maze here. So the add-on I'm using is called Maze Mesh. And what it does is when you have a grid like this, you just go up to Mesh in Edit Mode Mesh and then uh, just hit the Maze Mesh button, which is, is there when you have the add-on. And then it basically just does this. It just creates a maze out of that selection you had there. And it can work on any object. It doesn't have to be a plane. As long as you have a, a grid uh, on any mesh, it'll do that. And then what I'll do is just select one of the top faces, uh, select co-planner, or do that, or just select the top vertices, delete everything else, and then just extrude that up. And that'll just give you a basically much easier, cleaner mesh to use. Um, and, and then you can obviously do whatever you want with it from there. So I'm just putting it into this cube. I'm trying out different ideas here with... Um, I didn't end up using that, but I'm just trying a bunch of stuff here. You'll see me go through a bunch of different ideas. So I, I know roughly what I want, which is a big maze structure in the middle doing something, but I'm not exactly sure. So that's this is where it's fun to just experiment sometimes. And um, I know I've been talking about using references and I, I was recommending that, but sometimes it is fun to just go in with no reference and just experiment and see what kind of weirdness you get. And that's where you get these really surreal renders. Sometimes is when you're just kind of doing whatever ideas your brain generates as you're working on this stuff. Um, so you'll see me here just trying a bunch of things like extruding out certain parts and stacking these on top of each other and then trying out different angles and just seeing what kind of stuff might work. So this is obviously a bit too crazy at this point. Could be cool if I went down this path, but I decided to not do this because it was a bit much happening there. And you can see me going through, yeah, multiple different things here. Um, I'm, I'm moving certain parts to collections and hiding those collections, duplicating it out and rearranging it in different ways. So here I'm going into Quixel Bridge and I'm just searching for a stone texture. Now you can use textures from anywhere, from ambient CG or textures.com or Polyhaven or whatever you want. Um, I'm just used to using Quixel. So I'm just exporting a random stone brick kind of texture from there. And I'm just putting that on here, taking out the displacement because I do not want that. And then I'm just applying the scale and then doing a, doing a cube projection on everything. So just un quickly unwrap the whole thing at once with a cube project. And then uh, I'll actually swap this texture out for another one later. But for now, it's just good to have something at least in there so I can get a sense of what the texture is going to be. And then I'm adding a basic uh, spotlight in here. So this is, I think, one of the main lights I used in the end. And But it took me a while to get to the final positioning of this light. So... You'll see me over the next little bit uh, just moving that around a lot and trying out a, different, a bunch of different positions for it to be in. And then I'm just getting volumetrics in here as well. So cube over the whole scene, go into uh, viewport display, display as bounds just to get it out of the way. And then go into the shader editor for that object, plug in a volume scatter or principled volume that can work too. And then you'll basically have it so dense that it's just a brick. Uh, just lower the density to like 0 0.01, 0 0.005, something around there. And then you'll get some nice uh, haze over the whole thing. And then I like to in increase the anisotropy, which just makes it feel a bit more cool and cinematic sometimes. And then, uh, yeah, that's the volume setup I use in almost every render. So here I'm just moving that position of the light around. And this is where I never can get it the first try, or almost never. Um, it always almost always takes a lot of trial and error to move the lights around and and get the right spot for the light. Um, but you you just saw me took out, take out the background there. So it's just pitch black with one light. And that's usually the best way for me to figure out 
the positioning for the main light of the scene. Um, so I'm just trying out more ideas here, hiding these things so that I can come back to them later if I want, but they're not uh, in the way. So I'm adding another grid here, and I'm just going to try that mesh maze thing again, but with a few different level of, levels of subdivision. So I'm actually just going to subdivide this one a lot, go into the middle and just take out the middle portion of this plane. So I'll just delete that, uh, select all this, go up to maze mesh, and then just adjust the amount so that it isn't glitching out. And then that will, so, so this is where this add-on is quite interesting is because you can actually use this to uh, do it on like kind of any mesh. I was trying it on like the Suzanne head, which didn't work quite well, didn't work that well, but um, as long as you have a, a surface, which is a grid subdivision, then it should work very nicely. So I'm just deleting everything else except for the top vertices, extruding it back down, because as you saw, there wasn't really a proper backside. So if you just do that, it'll fix it. And then uh, you'll see me do this a couple more times with this similar kind of setup, but I'm just gonna try out a few different levels of subdivision and ways to do it. So there's another one with a bit less subdivisions. And uh, basically I just have a few of these different mazes around here now, which I can use throughout the scene. And this is really what the whole scene is built out of is these core pieces that you can see right here, kind of a big medium and small level of subdivision with the maze uh, on those pieces there. So I was moving this piece down to the floor and I kind of realized that if I moved the camera up to match where that was and have it pointing more downwards, that was going to be a lot cooler. So well, as soon as I moved it up there, I knew that that was going to be the camera angle because it just looks a lot better. And then that really actually got me a lot more excited to work on this because I wasn't quite sure it was what I was doing before. But at this point, uh, I felt pretty confident of where I was going. And sometimes that's a good trick is just move the camera around to a completely different angle. And that'll give you, uh, well, a new perspective on it, but also just help you get a lot more inspired to work on the scene. It doesn't always work, but when it does, it could be quite nice. So you can see me here. The rest of the scene really is just built off of these pieces. Um, I am swapping the texture out though. So that first stone texture didn't quite like it. So I just uh, swapped it for less of like a bricky kind of thing and more of a regular pure rock kind of texture. And then uh, one thing you'll see me do is again, just take out displacement and then also decrease the strength of the normal map. I find that for big scenes like this, when you have a, a rock texture on it, sometimes just lowering down the normal map strength makes it feel a bit bigger and more realistic. So here I'm opening up a pattern from, uh, this is actually an AI generated pattern from mid journey. And I'm going to use that to mix into the base color, um, just to add a bit more stuff happening and different lines and cool, intricate little things happening there. So I'm basically, you'll, you'll see me, the, the nodes are going to get really messy here. And I apologize for that. But basically what I'm doing is I'm just using the pattern to, uh, I'm actually using the pattern itself as the mix factor to mix it in. And I'm also adding in noise just a regular noise texture, which is also getting mixed into that mix factor. Um, sorry if that's confusing, but basically what I'm saying is it's noise and the pattern coming together, which is the mix factor for the pattern to get mixed into the base color of the stone. Um, if that's really confusing, you could just set the blend mode to multiply. That'll work too. Uh, won't give you quite the same look, but that's another way to do it. It's what I do all the time too. Okay. So that's in there. Um, just adds a nice level of detail to the texture. just makes it feel a bit more cool. And then the next thing I'm going to do for detail is just do a bunch of uh, loop cuts and bevels and insets and extrusions. So basically just taking the, me the mesh and just trying to add in, uh, just manually add in some detail by doing insets and kind of just pulling certain sections in. And uh, this is a nice way that I use a lot just to add more detail to things that are a bit blank. So this works all the time on archways and pillars and stuff like that. You'll see me do that all the time on those kinds of things. And then um, here I'm just basically taking the same few pieces that I've already made. And I'm going to be doing this a lot throughout the whole video, but duplicating this into uh, basically just repeating these patterns until it starts to not look good. Uh, that's a strategy I use quite a lot is just duplicate until it starts to look bad. Uh, because it'll look better up to the point where it starts looking worse. And then that is often something you can do to just build out a whole scene that looks cohesive. So I'm just taking uh, these platform things and just 
duplicating them around and trying out different layouts here. And I know at this point, this isn't like the final thing. I'm, I'm actually okay with having it get a little bit too crazy and chaotic because I can always dial it back. But um, if you just kind of splatter a whole bunch of ideas onto the wall, let it get a little bit chaotic and, and then spend a bit of time afterwards bringing the order back into it. That's a strategy I like to use a lot. So here you can see me going into the asset browser. This is the pack that I made with Sweeper 3D. This comes with the new fantasy environments course. If you want to get it, I'll leave a link below. Basically, uh, I and him, basically, we just spent weeks literally doing nothing except 3D modeling every single day, this ginormous pack. Um, so if you want to use it, there's tons and tons of cool fantasy models in there. Uh, I've been using it a lot in my renders. And yeah, if you want to use it in your work too, you can get it linked below. It comes as part of the course. So I'm just dropping in a railing here um, from that pack. A ray modifier on that just to get two of them in a row. Apply scale, we'll just get rid of whatever's going on there. And I didn't use too many models from this pack, but I did use another stair thing, uh, just like a set of stairs, which I kind of modified after two. Uh, not this one, but the other one here. This is one that Sweeper made. And sometimes when you have stairs in a render like this, it can just be an, a really nice way to anchor it and make it feel um, a little bit less abstract and crazy and more like a place you could actually walk in. Uh, and, and also with stairs, it gives you a very clear sense of scale and how big things are. So that's why I like adding things like stairs and railings in here is just because when you have something that's this abstract and weird, sometimes it's nice to just bring it back to reality a little bit with some, some familiar objects. Um, some familiar objects or things like people, which I'll add later. But that's where it's nice to have things like that. So again, duplicating the same couple of pieces throughout the whole scene. Um, I'm, I don't be afraid to like reuse the same model a bunch of times. Often you can't really tell that it's duplicated and it, it more often than not, it will just make it feel more cohesive and actually like the whole thing's meant to fit together. Um, and then here I'm just dropping in a pillar from the same pack. I'm kind of cutting through a lot of time here, but um, I tried a bunch of different places to put this in. And here's what I mean, where it's like, it gets a little bit too chaotic. And then I dial it back after and just kind of keep what looked good with that chaos I just added. So those pillars aren't going to be as crazy as they are here, but um, they're going to be like in the bottom section and throughout the scene in places that make sense for it to be in. It'll be there. But um, it's not like I'll delete some of the top ones where it doesn't really need to be there. So this is sped up, but really what I'm doing here is nothing that new. I'm just kind of messing around with the lighting a little bit, like adding in different objects to cast shadows on the light, just to try and make it a bit more interesting. So it's not a, a big blank sheet of light coming down. And then I'm just duplicating the same pieces that I made at the beginning throughout the scene, um, adding a bunch of stuff in a bunch of different places, bringing it back a bit, deleting stuff, uh, kind of bringing a bit more order back into it. Uh, but it's kind of a, this balance of like adding a bunch of stuff and making it, a bit, making it a bit crazy and then dialing it back a little bit to come back to a place that's a bit more reasonable. And then kind of repeating that over and over again. And eventually you end up with um, a finished render. So there's not much I can say about this part here because it's really just a lot of like moving things around just a little bit here and there and just seeing what is going to look better. And you can see it's getting duplicated quite a lot. So it's I'm trying to get it out into the distance a little bit more. And then I can shine some other lights in uh, in some spots in the distances by just duplicating the spotlight and then kind of moving it out there. Here I'm adding some people. So this is just a random pack of people from, I think, CG Trader, uh, which is just a website with a ton of 3D models. It's like, I think it's a paid pack. I'm not like affiliated or anything. It's just some random thing I bought a long time ago. But however you want to get a person in there, just find some models, download them. There's free ones out there too you can find. Um, and then that, adding in some models of people like this can be a really nice way, again, to bring it back to reality a little bit when you have this really abstract thing. And also it just adds a sense of scale as well. You know exactly how big a person is. So when a person is standing on something, you know how big that thing is. So if you have something giant with a bunch of people on it, which are small, makes the whole thing feel even more giant. Um, and I think it also is nice in an abstract vendor like this for the reason I mentioned before, which is it makes it, it like it brings it back to reality a little bit, makes it feel kind of like a place that you could be exploring, which is a, a feeling that I really like to have in my work. 
Um, so if you know, you can imagine if there's people there, it's like, well, it's somewhere you can go. So that's kind of a nice feeling to have in there sometimes. And the rest of this is really just the same thing of me messing around and just moving, moving objects around and just trying to fit this puzzle together in the way that looks the best. Um, and there's not that many tips I can give for that other than just don't give up, just keep trying, uh, take a break if you need to, but, um, yeah, just moving things around it. And I think spending not too much time, but a good amount of time on this stage, which is kind of boring. Uh, that's really where you get it from like a, a pretty good render to a very good render is spending time just trying to make all the pieces you've added fit together in the best way possible. So after a bit of Photoshop work, like just adding contrast and saturation and clarity, and then like a curves adjustment, grain sharpening, here's the final result. Um, so I hope that was enjoyable. So if you made it this far in the video, again, you might want to check out the new fantasy environments course. Like I said, we literally spent weeks modeling all the stuff in there that is in the pack. I also spent like thousands of dollars hiring other artists to create other custom packs uh, for everyone to use in the course. So you can use it in commercial work, whatever, plus a full course built around all these assets, teaching you how to make environments like you can see here. So if you want to check this out, I'll leave a link below. Uh, other than that, Thank you for watching and I'll see you in the next one.